All right, good evening. Lord, reign in me. One, two, three. Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you reign in But my one request, Lord, my only aim is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? Lord, reign in me, reign in your power. Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. We pray that you just be with us as we worship you tonight. Lord, as we hear your word, Lord, just help us to have open hearts and minds to what you have for us tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. May our homes be filled with and May our streets be filled with joy. May injustice run to Jesus as your people turn to pray from the Yeah. 
Everlasting, reigning on. 
sitting down on that side, keeping it from flying up. I appreciate that. Okay, that'd be even better. That'd be even better. Well, it's good to be with you tonight. I missed you on Sunday. Just had a little passing thing, you know, one of them things that comes in the night, and as I was telling them, it passes quickly, but not quickly enough. But anyway, I'm good. Everything's good. I appreciate it. Glad to be here tonight. Dr. Stone, is, he and Paul Ed is taking a couple of three days for a little R&R. &R much needed R&R, &R, so just remember them in our prayers when we come to it tonight, that they uh, safe traveling and get back safely, but um, anyway, good to be with you. You know, we are in the throes of a presidential election. I say throw, you know the throes I'm talking about, those throes that are painful and struggling because I'm so tired of hearing all the campaigning. And I know you are. I just want it to be over. How I many was it? Another week? Two weeks? Two weeks? <sighs> anyway, how much truth is out there? How much truth do you think is out there? You know, each candidate, and especially the media, they want to fact check each other. You know, and you know maybe that's not a bad thing, except when the media puts their thumb on the scale and adds their part to it. You know, then. Hey, what's, tr what's the truth? Who's telling the truth? If I hear another political candidate or anybody in the news media say, let me be perfectly clear, I think my head's going to explode. I'm telling you. The problem is they're not perfectly clear and they're not being truthful. That's the problem. I think it was Ben Franklin who said, Half a truth is the greater lie. So if you don't have all the truth, it can be a worse deception than an out-and-out -out lie. I think he was right. But how about this? Do you remember the, uh, I'm telling my age, back in the 60s, they came out with a TV show, I think it was the later part of, latter part of the 60s, to tell the truth, which they've done that a couple of times since then, but I, I don't watch any of that new stuff. I don't like that. But, but back then, you know, they had... I think like four celebrity panelists, and then they had three, uh, they had the host, and they had uh, three people that come out. One of them had an unusual job or profession, and the other two were imposters. Y'all remember that? And, they were, and the deal was, uh, they had, the panel had to guess after some questions, which were the guided questions, kind of reminds you of the media today, but guided questions from the host to them and the person who was the real character had to tell the truth but the other two could lie 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 any way they wanted to so that was the whole thing and you know at the end of the end of the show you were hoping that you had enough information you could tell who was telling the truth but the whole premise of the show was built around trying to deceive the panel trying to mask the truth. I mean, the one guy was telling the truth, but the other two were liars, lying. So that was the whole premise of the show. You know, that's all, it was, it was amusing and entertaining, at least we thought it was back then, but when you think about it, being deceived by a lie in the real world, that's not funny at all. It ain't funny at all. So you say, well, where in the world did they get such an idea for a TV show to lie? Try to fool somebody, deceive them. Well, we're going to look at that tonight, and i tell you where it started. It started back in the very beginning in Genesis, and that's where we're going, in Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, if you want to be turning there. And every time I'm thinking about deception and lies, I read a book about 35 years ago. I'm not going to say that, but it has been. It's been about 35 years. It's by Don Richardson, and the name of the book is Peace Child. Have any of you ever read that book? Peace Child. If you get a chance, get it and read it. He was a missionary to New Guinea back in the day. And this, as I say, the book was written in 1972, so it was before that. 
but he was a missionary in New Guinea, and he was with the uh, one of the tribes down there, the, the Sway tribe, I think it was, Sway tribe. Anyway, they were headhunters and cannibals, and he was a missionary. It is a compelling story. It's one you won't forget. After 35 years, I hadn't forgot that story. It's very good. If you get a chance, read it. But deception and lies, if you want to see the, the height of deception and lies, read that book, Peace Child. It has a great ending as well. But anyway, while you're, you should be there by now in, in, on the, in Genesis. You know, I know this is one of the, the most familiar stories in the Bible, the most familiar accounts in the Bible, the, the story of Adam and Eve and uh, the fall of man. But you know, God tells us to look back and remember. He tells us to look back and remember what he has done. And we turn on over to Solomon, and he says, Solomon says, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. He says, what has been, it will be. And what will be done, will be done again. So it just tells us, we can look back in God's word, even to the very beginning, and relate to where we are now. We can. So let's look in Genesis chapter 2. Let's look at verse 8, beginning in verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So God had formed a paradise for man. And can you imagine, as we're told, it had every good thing to eat in it? I'm, I just have trouble imagining how great that would have been. But in it had the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God gave Adam a simple command, a simple, truthful command. Do not eat of the tree of the good and evil, for if you do, you will surely die. He gave him the command of the truth, the stark truth, nothing but the truth, and it was simple. And he also told him the consequences. I mean, I like those kind, if, then, a conditional thing, conditional promises. You know, if you do this, then that. If I dive in the middle of the bay out there and I don't come up, come up I'm going to drown. If you dive in and don't come up, you're going to drown. It's about the same thing here. You will die. Now we move over to chapter 3 and enter Satan. And he's using the serpent to speak to the woman. Now she hasn't been yet named yet at this point. She hasn't been named. This is verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now the woman has heard God's simple truth of not to eat of that tree. That if you do, you'll die. But she's even added a part, don't even touch it. So did she get the truth from Adam? I mean, from God? Or did she hear it from Adam? And Adam actually told her, don't even touch it. We don't know that. The scripture doesn't tell us that. But she has heard the truth. And again, she has heard the consequences. Don't eat of it or you will die. In verse 4, it says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So there's the lie. We got the truth. Now here's the lie. He says, you won't die. You'll be like the gods, knowing good and evil. You know, well, that's, you know I've, I, that sounds pretty good. It sounds better than what God told me. I'm not going to die, and I'm going to know good and evil, and I'm going to be like gods. That's sounding better than what God told me. And you know, I like the part about having more knowledge. 
So I'm really considering this. That might have been what was running through Eve's mind. In verse 6 it says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam, I like, I've always liked that. God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The cool of the day, boy, that sounds so relaxing. I, I, I've always liked that sentence, the cool of the day. Anyway, God was walking in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? <clears throat> and here we go. God already knew the answer. God knew why Adam was hiding. You know, man thinks that he can hide from God. He still thinks he can hide from God. We can't. We can't hide from God. And verse 12 says, And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me the tree, the fruit of the tree, and I did eat. So when God said, Did you eat of it? Well, I'm not going to answer that directly. But that woman you gave me, she gave it to me. And I ate it. So he don't want to take the blame. He wants to give it to her, but he also wants to blame God for giving him the woman. Does that still happen today? Not so much in that sense, but God gives you something good and you let it be used for evil or bad against you and you want to blame God for it because it got out of hand, it got out of where it was intended to be and you want to blame God for giving you something good you know, God could have said, Adam, paraphrasing, he said, Adam, I gave you her. I took her from a rib from your side, from under your arm, so you could protect her. So where were you when she needed you? You should have been with her. So sit down over there. So then God says to the woman, what is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And neither one of them want to just say, I did it. I did it. There's something for not passing the blame. But you know, the art of lying is, I would almost say it's been honed to fine perfection these days. <clears throat> But what they've done, they have lost God's trust. They've lost God's trust in them. Take, for example, you're working in the, and you've got a boss, and he says, <clears throat> he says, Terry, he says, I want you to call this equipment company and check on that piece of equipment that we've had down there being worked on for two weeks. We need it. We need it bad. He says, you call them and find out what's going on. So I get busy, distracted for whatever reason. I don't call them. So the next morning, the boss calls me over and says, Terry, did you call that company? And I was like, oh. Am I going to lie? I'm going to flat out tell the truth. I could say, well, I called him, but the guy I needed to talk to wasn't in, so I left him a message, and he ain't called me back yet. And so, okay, whew, I'm off the hook, maybe. Then the boss says, Terry, we're going to call him right now. Get him on the phone and give me the phone. So he calls him. He says, John, didn't you get Terry's message yesterday to call you about that piece of equipment? No, John, hear John through the phone. No, he didn't call me. I was here all day. Didn't have much going on. I didn't hear from him. Okay. 
what about the piece of equipment? They go on and explain all that, and he hangs up the phone, and he's looking dead at me. What have I done? I have lost the trust of my boss because I lied to him, and he caught me in the lie. Now, how long will it take, if ever, can I regain that trust of him? Hey, he may just say, start looking for another job. I can't trust you. God didn't do that to Adam and Eve. But notice, as he starts asking, he started asking Adam first because Adam was pretty much in charge. He got the command straight from God, don't eat of the tree. And then he gave it to Eve. So he asked Adam first, and he got that answer from Adam. And then you notice he asked Eve, and he got her answer. And now she blames the serpent, and, you know, he's got, rightly so. I mean, he's, he's the one that did deceive him. So now God turns to the serpent, and this is what he says. In verse uh, 14 and 15, this is chapter 3, and it says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So when they lost God's trust by disobedience, breaking his commandment, not obeying the truth, they didn't physically die. They died a spiritual death and became separated from God. It would have been an eternal separation. But, except God had already had a plan before Adam and Eve ever answered him. He had a plan already to restore Adam, mankind, even before he fell into that abyss of separation. I find that amazing that God it's just amazing he had a plan for us even before we fell so God talks about the serpent now the consequences for the serpent the serpent the physical beast that Satan used to deceive Adam and Eve he said he would be accursed above every beast of the field and crawl on his belly and eat dust all the days of his life. And you know, we equate serpents with snakes. And most people don't have a very good outlook for snakes. I know one in particular, but most people don't. And they do crawl on their belly. And they do, and what God said, they're their, eat, their food will be mixed with dust as they eat for the rest of their life, all the days of their life. He would be looked on as a vile creature all of his days. And pretty much, <clears throat> society do, does look on snakes as vile creatures. Pretty much. But then in verse 15, it's spoken to the serpent, but it's meant towards Satan. When he says, I will put enmity between her seed and yours. You will bruise his heel and he will bruise your head. So that is Satan's plight and that is about Jesus. Bruise, the word bruise in Hebrew is shuf. And it has more than one meaning as a lot of times a lot of Hebrew words do. It can mean to crush or it can mean to strike at, as a serpent does. <clears throat> In this case, both meanings are here. Jesus was beaten and wounded as he went to the cross. He was bruised, he was struck at by Satan, not only then, but back when he was tempted as well. But he was really wounded and bruised when he was on his way to the cross by Satan. He struck at him, the heel. 
But Jesus bruised Satan's head, a fatal wound, crushed it. When he arose from that grave and defeated death, Satan was finished, crushed his head. So now, how can we understand the truth these days? Why is there so much confusion and uncertainty? We have to remember it all started with that first lie back in Genesis. So don't fall for the flowery and the flattery words of Satan, the half-truths that you might hear. Him and all he uses, don't fall for it. Take everything. The question is, do you take everything that you see and hear, and do you fact-check it against the Word of God to see if it lines up with what God says? That's what we have to do. We need to seek the pure and the simple truth that God gives us and obey. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. The way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. He was the way that God made for us to be reconciled to himself. Our fall came with that first lie of Satan. God's provided a path through Jesus Christ and his redemptive blood for us to be restored to him. So what's our job as a Christian? To tell the truth. In our everyday living, but mainly to tell the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our job, to tell his truth. Let's pray. Father, we come to you tonight, Lord. We come thanking you so much for your word. We come thanking you for the way of Jesus Christ that you made for us to be reconciled to you. Father, we thank you so much. Father, we just ask that you be with us tonight as we hear the petitions of those who, who need prayers, Lord. We ask you to be with Dr. Stone and Paul Ed as they travel. And Father, be with us now as we lift these up before you. In Jesus' name, amen.